there is a tree on the way in, um, right behind Church Hill, on the way to Crompton. And it's very interesting. Every time I drive past that tree, that tree captivates me. In fact, there used to be a barn behind that tree that they have now torn down, but that barn was actually the inspiration for my house and for my shop. And it's that tree and the idea of passing by that tree. And it doesn't matter what the season is, whether it's spring, summer, fall, or winter. It always captivates me. And I'm sure you can relate to this as well. You have that one tree, whether it's outside your front door or whether it's on your drive, that whenever you pass it, you notice it. And let's say right now in fall where the leaves are turning, you notice the leaves gently falling out of the tree and you're just captivated by it. Or in this um, winter time when all the leaves are off and you see that tree and you see that skeleton of that tree and you notice, wow, look at that beautiful balanced tree and look at the limbs and look at the trunk and look how the limbs get smaller. You just notice that tree for what it is. Or how about in spring when you're driving by and it's blossoming and you know, you're, you're just stop for a moment and you're captivated by what's happening. Or in the summertime, you're driving along listening to music and your windows are down and you pass under the shade of that tree and you feel that coolness coming off from underneath that tree. This is the way the tree is communicating with you and with me. What's very interesting is that um, you are communing or you at one with that tree at that particular point. Normally we live in a very fast-paced society where we're on the phone, picking up kids, got this drama going on and we're all in our heads. Well, the tree is always present. It's always in the present moment. But that moment where you are resonating with that tree, and what does resonating mean? Resonating means that you're in the same vibration as that tree in that particular moment. And when you're resonating, you are now being in the present moment. So isn't it interesting that the tree is always at the present moment and we're kind of in our hectic little world. So the tree is able to bring us back to our essential core, into our beingness. That's what they call us human beings. Um, so when you have this resonance with the tree and you so next time when, when, you have that, when you catch yourself and you're looking at that beautiful tree, you're walking out the door or wherever that your tree is, take a moment and take a deep breath. Just take a moment and feel the moment and be in that space of that tree. Be in that communion. Commune with the tree. Commune with nature. Co be at peace. And at the same time, I want you to be aware of something. The amazing, wonderful relationship that we live with that tree. That tree, as you take that breath, is the one that's making your oxygen. And when you're exhaling, that tree is taking your carbon dioxide and transforming it back into oxygen. So the tree is, uh, are the lungs for the, for the earth. Without the trees, we wouldn't be breathing. Isn't that amazing? I mean, do we, even think, do we ever think about that? Without trees, there would be no oxygen. And look at that wonderful relationship. We exhale carbon dioxide. The tree takes that carbon dioxide into itself, absorbs it, transforms it into oxygen, and at the same time, it produces a sugar which helps it to grow, and vice versa, then we are giving the oxygen which help us to exist and to be. Phenomenal, isn't it? We just take trees for granted, but they're really the essence to life. So when you're with that tree, and so we look at trees in the form of, okay, they give us shade, you know, they are a raw material, they give us lumber, but there's a disconnect between the tree and the lumber. And I'm fortunate enough that 
I have gone through that process of gone from tree to lumber. What happens, we need a piece of lumber and we go to Lowe's and we buy a square board. There's no personality in this board. We take it, we cut it, we build a barn, ah, we screwed it up, let's go get another one. It's just, it's just a commodity. There's no reverence to the material and where it came from. Now, I know there's some woodworkers in here, and so you understand a little bit more about the process of what happens from tree to, to um, lumber. But I'd like to share that with you. Um, so we'll put this piece of pine. We noticed we put it next to that door. So <laughs> that's a symbiotic relationship between those two. Um, so when, I have, when, when I'm called up um, by individuals about a tree, um, and I'm fortunate enough at this point that I can be very selective. But I like to, part of the reason why I moved back to the Eastern Shore was because of the size of the trees that exist here. These trees, and this is a beautiful example of a black walnut tree. This is a 150 year old black walnut tree. That's 150 years of weather, rain, energy from where it lived, winds from the bay, hurricanes, storms, fires, you name it. It's all absorbed into that tree, into the growth of the tree. As I was getting ready to come here today, I was thinking about this heavy, incredible rain that we had this morning. And if you think about that rain, ah, that was a nuisance to us. But you know what? For that tree, it wasn't a nuisance. That tree all the trees experienced an incredible amount of drought. And if you looked at the leaves, they were all kind of hanging. They were not ready to turn yet. They were kind of turning, but they were kind of hanging kind of limp because they were dehydrated. But this rain is putting moisture and life, prana, back into the tree. So as the tree is growing and the growth is happening, that's going to show up. It might be in a very small cellular uh, structure, but it will still show up. So a day like today is not insignificant to a tree of any size. Puts, puts bad weather in, in, into a perspective, doesn't it? So when I get these trees, um, or I go to uh, somebody's house and they say, OK, we have this tree. It came down. So um, I only take trees that have been either cut by a tree company or have cut, uh, come down by storms. I don't think it's my right to cut live trees. It's a living being. So what gives me the right to take this for my, well, you know, for, for my benefit? So my philosophy is just to salvage wood that's already been cut already down. I have a saying, hurricanes are really good to me. <laughs> and so, um, um, so when I have this tree, part of that tree, I feel, needs to come back to where it came from. So when people give me a tree, and most of the trees are given to me, I say, you know what? We need to make something of this tree so that the spirit of the tree can come back to the property and become a mantle or a bed or a table. It's just the energy of the tree comes back to where it left. So then I bring these trees to the property. I haul them there. And then we have to go through the sawing process. And the sawing process we do either with a small bandsaw mill, which can cut up to 24 inches. And if something is bigger than 24 inches, then we have to use a two-man chainsaw. And we have a two-man chainsaw with a six-foot bar. And that's what this was cut on. These were cut with a, band, uh, with a um, bandsaw mill. Now, when we're cutting this, I'm blessed and we have the experience of being the first person to experience what happens when that first slab comes off of there. We're being exposed to all that energy that that tree has gathered of all of the years, all that weather, all the circumstances that have led to its being or its, to its decay. And we're the first ones to experience as a board's coming off. The life prana is coming out at us. We're experiencing that. And I'll explain how we experience it. Um, some days we are milling a tree 
and it's a beautiful cherry tree. And we're all psyched and everybody's full of energy and everybody's working. And the next day, we get a tree and we're cutting into it and it's hollow and it's rotten and our mood slumps. And I say, hey Pete, how are you feeling? He says, kind of groggy. And I says, isn't it interesting that your mood is directly affected by the condition of the tree? And that's what I was talking about when I said the life prana, the prana of the tree. When it's beautiful, the tree is vibrant and it's releasing that prana. And that's how we're sensing that life force. But when the tree is, already, when the tree is dying or it started to rot, it started to decay, it's lost some of that prana. It's lost that life force. And so we feel that. But it's very, very subtle. And that's what I was talking again in the beginning when I was talking about being at one, being, communing with nature. These are very, very subtle experiences that we're having. And the young guys that work for me, when I point this out to them, they're like, oh yeah, you're right. I do feel this way. That's interesting. It opens up a whole new world for them. Wow, I never even thought about that. Um, so, after we mill the wood, we, d we go through the drying process. Now, I'm going to explain the drying process to you in the form of a grape. Um, a grape is full of water, and when you eat one grape, you, we're talking again about that prana, you're getting that life force and all that juice out of that one grape, and you're savoring that one grape. Now, when we dry wood, we want to get rid of that water, so we allow the water to evaporate. So basically what we're making is a raisin. And so the language or the volume or the, the message that the wood's giving to us is a lot even more quiet than it was when it was the grape. The grape, you just eat one and you get that full essence. Versus raisins, you've got to take a handful to get the same effect. So when wood is dry, the message that comes from the wood is much more quiet and it's much harder to detect. Okay. So, when, when, I, when we cut the uh, lumber, so the first thing we do is I cut things from one inch thick, which is that thickness, to three inches thick. Now, I dry per inch, it takes per inch three years of drying time. And you would wonder, wow! So that means if we have a three inch board, that's nine years of drying. So these big slabs which we cut into three to four inches, that's nine to twelve years of drying time. The reason why we do this is because we want to let the wood get, it gets rid of the surface moisture very quickly. But what we want to do is season the wood. And if you, that's a technical term for wood that's dry, seasoned wood. And it was interesting when I was doing this talk and I was thinking, wow, that's a really cool term. Because seasoned wood means it allows the wood to go through a season. And that's really why I'm drying it per inch three years. Because I want to let it go through the season, expand and contract. Expand and contract. And it's like a rubber band. If you take a rubber band and keep stretching it, what happens with time? It loses its elasticity. Well. Wood has the same memory in its grain as a rubber band. So as it's going through the expansion and the contraction, and the expansion and contraction, it mellows, it softens, it loses that memory. So then it gives you a material that you can work with. Um, so then um, from having the wood Stickered, what we call it stickered, we put it outside with stickers in between to let the main surface moisture uh, disappear and evaporate. And actually we do something really cool. If we mill in the summertime and we have a big stack of lumber, then we go and stand with our shirts off right behind the pile and it's like air conditioning. It's amazing, it's so cool. The breeze coming through there, is, it's just cool air. And um, it's not more than once that we have done that and said, come on, let's go stand by the, by the pile of wood. Um, so after it's um, lost its majority of its water, it goes into another building where it's out of the weather and it's out of the elements. And there it stays till it gets uh, transferred again to the shop. And these are all stages where once it gets to the shop, I allow the wood to acclimatize to the, con the weather con or the climate in the shop. 
but keep letting the wood adjust to the surroundings because eventually it's going to go from outside to the inside. Now, just in the last couple of years, I've um, made it my practice to finish, and this is important, to finish kiln drying the wood. And the reason why I've only finished kiln dry it is all our homes today are six, um, you know, we have radiant floor heat, we have um, uh, central air, which is very dry, wood stoves. Um, if I put a piece of air dried lumber, which is about 12 to 15 uh, percent, into a home that's very dry, then the wood would have, have more movement. So by putting it in the kiln, after it's been in the shop, all I'm doing is taking it down to 6 to 8 percent, so it does its final movement in a controlled environment, and then it gets shaped. So, um, contrary to industry standard, which is to cut lumber while it's green, stick it in the kiln, and dry it as fast as you can, because you've got to make a profit. You know what happens to the wood? It, when it comes out, it's still wood, but we, it, the molecular structure of the wood has changed. It's the same thing that happens when you put that rubber band on the dashboard of your car, and what happens? It gets all brittle, and it breaks, and we, you have changed the molecular structure of that rubber band. Well, wood, same thing happens. Um, the color changes, the cell structure changes, and I don't know how many of you have bought a board from Lowe's and go to cut it at the table saw, and when you cut it, it does one of these. That's because the tension in the wood, it never got to relax. Everything that just got frozen in place. So that's the reason why I go through this extensive process of letting it season properly. Um, another thing I wanted to touch upon um, is when we mill, and why we go through such effort to mill, industry standard is to cut a square board. Well, I, this, this is a little bit squared off here, but I prefer to mill wood that's called live edged. All my pieces of wood have the natural edges on them. And that is um, because this way the wood really can express itself. Once I start working with the wood, I have so much more to work with. I have, can listen so much more to the board rather than a board that has no edges. It limits me what I can do with it what it wants to tell me, what it wants to become. So we go through extra, so we basically mill everything in what's called a flitch. And we mill the log. The way it came apart is the way we stack it, just with stickers in between. And it's a beautiful sight when you see it. It's this log just all, all, in, all in sections. So when the lumber is dry and um, clients commission me to do a piece, uh, the, one of the first steps is I go and see their um, setting where they live because that's a personality in itself. Then I invite the clients to come to the shop and I get to know them a little bit. And what I, what I do then at the shop is I match personalities. So we have the personality of their home decor. We have the personality of the individual. Well now, let's say they want a bed, a table, um, uh, a door, whatever it is, it's important that the piece of wood, like people and relationships, that the piece of wood, that they um, have a resonance. Again, we're going back to the same concepts, that there's a resonance between the client and the piece of wood for the piece of furniture. I'm 75% there if they are in love with the piece of wood. And the experience is always wonderful. I get to meet the clients. I get to see what their personality is. A lot of times we got chalk and we're drawing on these boards and we're designing the piece. You know, um, we did a desk and we're just laying it out on a piece of wood. And then when, when, that first, when that piece of wood is pulled out that people are resonating with, if they're like, that's it. That's the piece of wood. That's the relationship that they have then with the piece of wood. My work, a majority of my work is made very easy at that point because they're already starting off as, with, with, as a friendship. I'm not introducing this foreign body into their, into their home. So um, after they leave, um, then it's, it's, it's my job 
to go and sit with the piece of wood and put my ego aside and my agenda aside. And as I was talking about earlier, you know, what I was talking about the raisin, um, the wood now, the, pran, the, the wood's always alive, but the prana, the, the, the vibrancy is gone. So what, when the wood talks to me, it's very quiet and very, very subtle. So it's very, I have to be in a very calm place, in a very observing place to listen what does this piece of wood want to become at this point? And having these natural edges helps in that process. Um, a lot, sometimes, you know, I see a piece of wood and I can go to the workbench and I can grab some tools and I can just go right at it. It just flows. But sometimes I come along in the process and boom, I'm moving along and suddenly I'm like, I don't know what to do. And I look at the piece of wood and the piece of wood says, I want to become this. Like, no, that, that's, that's not going to work. Nine, you know. Um, so then I have to sit with it. I have to go and I, have to, I stop. I stop with that piece. And I sleep on it. And I come back again the next day. And then I might email the clients and say, I have this idea, but I'm not sure it's going to work. And it's so funny. When I do this, I email them, and then they come on the weekend. By that time, I'm like, oh, man, this idea is perfect. It's great. I've gotten over my agenda and I'm listening to the subtleties of the wood. Just recently I did a desk, and it was one of those situations where I've, the desk just wanted to have this curve curving down at the end of it. And I was like, my, in my mind it said that something just wants to fall off the desk. But after I sat with it, I said, wow, I could do that, and, but then create this carving that becomes this ribbon, and it just became this incredibly beautiful detail that just totally surprised me. This entire desk was just listening what the wood wanted to become. And I have to say, this one piece surpassed my expectation. And I normally, am, I have an expectation and I meet it. But in this case, I was like, wow, that one way beyond what I expected, and it was only because I was listening. So, um, when I have a, you know, so um, let, me, let me talk about a piece of wood here for a moment and um, explain some, some of the wonderful things that are happening. Um, in here, we have what's called the crotch of the tree. So that means that a branch is growing this way and a branch is growing that way. So what happens in the crotch of the tree is that some grain runs this way and some grain runs that way and it creates a web because as it leaves are moving and the, and the stormy as it has been in the last couple of days if this was all straight grain that wood would just tear open but this intricate web prevents these two branches from tearing the tree apart so exposing this kind of grain creates what we call a crotch of a tree really really incredibly beautiful uh, wood um, in this particular case, so this is a black walnut, um, this is a maple, this is a curly maple, and this tree was really, really actually interesting. This is a limb, by the way. I couldn't get the trunk in here because it's so big. And this is, these, and, and this is the sexiest tree I've ever milled. The entire tree is this curly. I mean, it's just incredible. And if you look at the beauty of this wood, look what happens here at this branch. It's like a pineapple. That's something that you can't paint. That's, that's nature. That just grew that way. I mean, it's just absolutely magical. So it's my responsibility as a craftsman to interpret what has happened to this tree, how it's grown, and how can I bring this beauty out? So part of my philosophy is to, to give respect back to the tree is to build something that lasted for the same duration that it took the tree to grow. Now that's a big responsibility, but if a tree took 150 years to grow, it's my responsibility to build something that will last that long. And how do I do that? Well, there are several key factors. One of the factors is I have to use conventional joinery. The conventional joinery, which is used in most antiques, or actually all antiques, why do we, are these antiques around? Why do we call them antiques? They were 100 years old. 
they have to, that's quote unquote a real antique, something that's over 100 years old. But they use conventional joinery. And the conventional joinery works and allows the wood to expand and contract. A, a point I almost forgot to mention. Wood's always alive, always. It doesn't matter how long it sits around, it always expands and contracts. That's the beauty, but the challenge with wood. You're always live, working with a living being, living substance, and it's always expanding. So by using that conventional joinery, it allows for the wood to move. Today, a lot of people build with fasteners or with um, biscuits or composites. Well, they don't work so well in conjunction with wood because they don't expand and contract at the same rate. So when I'm responsible for building something that will last 150 years, 80 years, even 30 years, I cannot incorporate a metal fastener. I cannot incorporate a biscuit. I always use part of the same tree. If I'm making a biscuit or I'm making a, um, a spline, I use part of that wood for that spline. It moves and expands and contracts at the same rate. The other responsibility I have, besides the construction, is my design. My design has to be a design that fits today, fits tomorrow, and fit yesterday. Basically what I call a timeless design. Because if my design is out of fashion in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, it gets thrown away. I've just discredited that tree. So again, as I said, this is a big responsibility. So the interesting thing is, if I listen to the wood and I'm true to the piece of wood, it becomes a timeless design. Interesting, isn't it? Um, so one, um, one of the other things um, that I uh, didn't mention is, when I'm talking with clients, um, wood and its personality. For instance, if I'm um, building a table um, for um, some gentleman, I would most likely pick walnut. Why? Because it's very masculine. Um, walnut is a, you know, I, I think of walnut as the leather couches, the cognac, and a fireplace, you know. Um, versus for a female, I would pick cherry. It's soft, it's feminine, it's gentle. It's the characteristic of the woods. Interestingly enough, maple is kind of in a neutral place. Um, again, this is another piece of uh, black walnut here. Um, and I brought a piece of wood which surprised me. This is American elm, and actually this tree came from Washington College, and this was one of the f earlier trees that I milled. That's why it's actually got um, straight edges, because we used a big circular saw to mill this. And I always thought this was a masculine wood. But no male has ever walked into my shop and said, that's beautiful. <laughs> it's the women that walk up and say, this is beautiful. So it's very interesting, the personality of the wood that comes out and who it speaks to and who it resonates with. Um, so what's uh, what I really love about this piece of wood, and I think maybe this is why it speaks to women, do you see the picture in that? <laughs> is, that a, is that a Madonna holding a child? I mean, you know, again, it's, it's a painting. It's, pain, it's, a, it's, it's created by nature. It's just, just incredible. Um, this piece of walnut actually is a, uh, before we, when we came here, pizza. I'd never seen a piece of walnut like that, and I actually have never either. For some reason, this walnut, um, it, it is a slice cut probably off, off of a curved um, piece, a uh, uh, log, and um, just having these streaks in there is just really, really unique. And it's just kind of fun to, you know, to have this piece of wood, and I don't know if I ever would make anything out of it, but um, it, it just, it's just a beautiful piece of wood and uh, interpretation of nature. So, let me see. I don't think. Um, oh, so one of the things that I'm um, thinking of and, um, is that. So when we're milling, I'm going to jump back to the milling process. It's very important 
Most loggers or people who mill, they want straight logs. And I don't want straight lumber. Straight lumber is boring. Straight lumber doesn't have all this character. Straight lumber, this is straight lumber. Boring. Um, what I like is lumber that's curved. And why do I like lumber that's curved? Because I can use that curved lumber f to my advantage. A lot of my things have curves in it. So the grain of the wood, I can follow it with the, with the lumber. So I, I already get the strength out of the wood from the curve of the log. So maximizing how I can cut this log or this tree to get the most amount of uh, material that will down the road benefit my my in my construction process. So I want to thank you very much for you sitting here and coming today on this rainy day. Now I know a lot of things that I probably mentioned to you are things that you already knew. But as in my discussion with Jackie, things that we already know, sometimes they're just underlying. And hopefully by me talking about them, they brought, I brought them into your awareness, into your consciousness. And now you can think about them a little bit more open and say, oh, that's what that is. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you.